Hi, it's all of you. <laughs> cool. I want to show you my grandmother. So this is Kaltum uh, Shihabi. My grandmother is, was born in Palestine in a village called Lubia. This is a video of her. Uh, I'll explain what it's, she's doing in a bit. But so she was born in Lubia in 1937. In Lubia, she, was, she lived there until 1948, which is when the ethnic cleansing of Palestine happened. After that, we, we call the ethnic cleansing of Palestine in Arabic the Nakba, or the catastrophe. After she fled Palestine, she went to Damascus, where she lived until 2012. And in 2012, she had to flee to fled to flee again, this time she went to Canada. And in this video, you see her as a refugee again for the second time in her life. But here she's doing her English homework for the English class that she has not missed since the day she arrived in Canada. This is a video that my, her classmate, her, who's 23 years old, uh, took of her while she was not looking. <laughs> This is a map of Lubia, my grandmother's village, just before it was destroyed in, the, in, uh, in 48. It was made by the British colonial authorities, and it shows a lot of the texture that was present in, Palest in Lubia just before it was destroyed. You can see the houses, you can see the school, you can see the, the, the fields, the, uh, the agriculture that was happening there. This is what it looks like right now. The bold spot in the middle is, the, uh, is where the houses were. The green is the forest that was planted to replace our farms. It was planted with European pine trees. And there, in the side, you see an exclusively Jewish settlement replacing what was Lubia. Teta. Teta Imajid, as I know her, uh, knows a lot about daily life in Lubia. She knew where we baked our bread, how we baked our bread. She knew how to press olives. She knew the ride on, of the donkey from the houses to the fields in the harvest season. The second Nakba of Palestine is when the last person who remembers Palestine as it was before the Nakba is no longer with us to tell the story of Palestine. Hopefully my grandmother stays with us for a long time, but she's 82. This is the only photo that remains, or that is known, of, Palest of Lubia, and this is it as it was being ethnically cleansed. So, throughout the Arabic-speaking world, we are realizing that the second Nakba is approaching. So there is this huge rush to collect as much information and data that we can about what life was like in Palestine before the Nakba. Organizations like Al Jana and the Nakba Archive have been collecting oral history testimonies to tell the story of a more vivid and nuanced story of Palestine. The Palestinian Oral History Archive has archived those collections and it's being released uh, in June in an open license. And it's not just about oral testimony, it's about what has remained in artifacts. So this is the Khazan archive of Palestinian ephemera. They've collected everything from advertisements, train tickets, magazines, anything that they could get their hands on. And they want to, through this archive, which is a physical archive, we're creating a record of what Palestine was like as a cultural hub of the region. It's a physical archive that's coming online. And it's not just Palestine. In Syria, we have the, the, the archive of the creative memory of the Syrian revolution that has been collecting uh, creative art that, made by people from Syria and publishing it in, uh, and archiving it in one place. We also have the new Palmyra project, which is started by Basil Khartabil. Uh, 
Basil created this 3D model of the ruins of Palmyra that are now destroyed by ISIS. The same technology that was used to create those, this 3D model of, uh, of Palmyra is now being used to reconstruct Notre Dame after it was burned. Even further from Syria and, uh, and Palestine, we have a massive movement to archive on an independent level. So these are, we have people collecting uh, independently. These are non-state institutions uh, or, and individuals trying to uh, document, non, uh, document political movements, document cultural heritage, and women's stories. So here we have the 858 archive of the, cultural of the Egyptian revolution, the Arabic music archive, the feminist oral history archives of both Syria, uh, both Lebanon and Egypt. We have the Wiki Gender project, the Arab Image Foundation, uh, the Syria Untold project, and the, the archive of the missing and disappeared in Lebanon. We are building those archives because we need them. The states that, that we are living in do not make their archives, their official archives accessible, and they're not even interested in hosting the knowledge that we are uh, interested in f as a people. How does this connect to the political movement? In the 30, 40s and 50s, and even the 60s, just after independence, there was a flourishing of political activity all across the region. And this flourishing of activity was very quickly, uh, systematically destroyed uh, in the 80s and up, and, and following it, even until now. You, here you can see the Tala' al-Ba'ath, or the Ba'ath pioneer, which is the, the youth branch of the Ba'ath party of Syria. It's training kids in schools to be as conformist as possible, and it's punishing any kind of disconformity or dissent. But it's not just the Ba'ath Party, it's not just internal. For, for Palestinians, we have had uh, the Israeli state systematically assassinating our, our democratic leaders and our cultural leaders and our intellectuals. In Palestine, outside of Palestine, whether it's in Europe or North America. And of course, we have the Oslo Agreement that neutralized any kind of resistance to, uh, to uh, and any kind of culture, democratic uh, movement. But in, Palest in Palestine and in Syria and in all across the region, we have a strong impulse for democracy. With the, the impulse has been repressed, but we have seen it burst out in Tahrir Square. We've, we're seeing it right now in Sudan and in Algeria. We're seeing it all across the Arabic world, and we're seeing it also in the diaspora of the Arabic world, in exile, in Berlin, uh, all over Europe and North America, and wherever there are Syrians or exiled refugees. So let's think about archives again. So we can read archives in two ways. One way of reading it is what it contains. The other way of reading an archive is what it does not contain. Do the archives represent our diversity? And I'm not just talking about the content, I'm also talking about the governance of those archives. Do they use licenses that uh, that represent the interests of the, the, of the content holders? Uh, do they create the right types of collaborations? Do they give the right access to the right people? Are they activated as archives and as cultural records in the right ways? This is why openness is important. Openness subverts the oppressive, violent, coercive, hegemonic powers and asserts the democratic right to access public knowledge and culture. Openness and democracy are dangerous concepts. They're dangerous to oppressive powers, 
which is why the Syrian regime killed our friend, and free cult our friend the free culture and open source activist Basil Khartabil. What does this look like in practice? I've, through the Basel Khartoubil Fellowship, I've been working on this project, the Palestine Open Maps. Palestine Open Maps is a collection of Palestine, historic maps of Palestine made uh, from the 1880s up to 48 by the British colonial authorities. And they document Palestine at a very intimate and detailed level. Here, uh, you can see a record of two of the maps that we have in our collection. The first one on the left is from 46, two years before the Nakba and the creation of the State of Israel. And the, left, the one on the left is three years after the creation of the State of Israel. They're almost identical. The one difference is the one on the 46 one says Palestine. The, 51, the 1951 uh, map says Israel. These maps are a record of the erasure of Palestine. But these are paper maps. They're just photos of papers. And we need to be able to make them more analyzable, more, more searchable, more accessible to as many people as possible. So how are we doing that? I've been holding, uh, I've been working with open source software to vectorize the content of those maps. I've held Eight mapathons so far. The most recent one was this morning, uh, uh, and we we have been extracting the data using OpenStreetMap infrastructure and making it openly accessible to anyone who wants it. Those mapathons are extremely special. This is the one mapathon that I held at a Palestinian refugee camp in the north of Lebanon, Badawi camp. I'm telling you, there's nothing that matches the the look on the, the teenagers' eyes when they see their maps, the maps of their villages for the first time. Those, those teenagers, 15-year-olds, they're Palestinian Syrians, they're Palestinian Lebanese, they're contributing to an open data set, they're actively contributing to knowledge production, and they're learning about the ugliness and the beauty of democratic practice of managing open archives. The question that I pose right now is, how do those archives reflect us? We have the 858 archive and the Tahrir Square protests uh, reflecting the same moment. Last year, the GlamWiki conference happened. It was an open Glam conference, and it happened in Tel Aviv, Israel. The, all of us Glam practitioners in all over the Arabic-speaking world were heartbroken. We cannot participate in this conference. Israeli state policy, racist Israeli state policy, does not allow us, me as a Palestinian, to go there. I think this can be remedied. How can we remedy it? I have three ideas. <laughs> as we know, it takes, it takes a child, a village to raise a child. And it also takes an entire community to raise an archive. So I want three things from you. I want you to create the spaces for us in our region to foster the development of our ideas, to foster the development of our practices, and to foster co uh, knowledge exchange. I also want you to support us with funding so that people, leader, leaders of our communities, can have the resources to actually do the, the, the much needed work that we need to do. And I also want us to exchange. We not, I want us to mutually support each other. 
uh, with resources, with our experiences, with our practices. This could be, take the shape of trainings, mentorships, partnerships. This is two-way. And this trinity of, uh, of types of support, I hope will make our communities much stronger. Thank you.